Welcome to a very special segment, a Q&A session with Father Robert Spitzer. You have enjoyed this whole course. I hope you've gained a lot out of it. I'm Shabal Reis, Director at Perusia, and we are so excited at the Perusia Academy to bring you this course on faith and science. What we're going to do now, we have our lecturer with us right now, Dr. Reverend Dr. Father Robert Spitzer, and he is with us who joins us. He's from the Marja Center, the founder of the Marja Center, also Credible Catholic. You can check out their website at marjacenter.com. Um, but he is with us to answer a few of these common questions. And I hope uh, this course has stimulated some of that for you. So let's, let's welcome him now. Thank you very much, uh, Father Spitzer, for joining us today. Oh, it's my honor, as always, Charvel. Thank you. Um, well, it has been a fantastic journey. Our students uh, have just gone through uh, from nothing to cosmos. Uh, this this idea of a course for the Perusi Academy uh, on faith and science, and you cover quite a lot of ground. Um, and I was hoping that we could sort of touch on um, some areas that that maybe pick up where you left off, and, and maybe even dive in a bit deeper into some other aspects of the course. Sure, that'd be Absolutely. fantastic. Uh, maybe uh, very quickly, and before I go into the first question, which is going to be on uh, evolution and the Big Bang Theory, we're going to touch on that. But before I do that, could you just uh, maybe in, in let the, the students know uh, a bit about um, the Marja Centre, um, and, and, and then we'll get started. Yeah, the Marja Centre is devoted to uh, looking not only at the reasons uh, for God's existence from both science and philosophy. Uh, certainly that is a major part of our mission, but we also uh, deeply investigate the theme of happiness and suffering. And also um, uh, we want to really look at the historical reality of Jesus and his significance. So uh, a while back um, uh, after I was president of Gonzaga University, I went ahead and started this institute because of the desperate need, there were many people out there uh, who were actually, uh, you know, making very false statements like, you know, the majority of scientists are atheists or something of that nature. Nothing could be further from the truth. 51% uh, of scientists are believers in God, about 20% um, are atheists, 21% are agnostic. And um, among young scientists, uh, young scientists, according to the last Pew survey, are 66%, not 51%, 66% theistic, believers in God. You know, so, you know, I began to hear these you know, terribly false statements that were being made in public. A lot of people in the new atheism movement were taking real liberties. Uh, by saying that you, there's no evidence for God from contemporary physics. Well, uh, now, of course, you know the Board of Lincoln and Guth proof, all of you have done the Nothing to Cosmos course. Uh, then, of course, you certainly know the entropy evidence. You certainly know some of the metaphysical dimensions, the fine-tuning coincidences. So all these things are, are really important. Um, but uh, so I just thought, well, you know, I'm going to just start an institute, um, not only to um, uh, develop all these materials and write the books and so forth, uh, but also to develop uh, curricula for high school um, and for middle school as well, for adult education and now for collegiate level uh, courses so that uh, people can really know the facts uh, rather than, you know, the usual, um, you know, slighting of the facts that uh, can oftentimes be done uh, in the social media or even in the traditional media. Yeah, wow. Well, thank you so much for what you're doing. It is such an important work. And I'm amazed that most of the content that's on those websites are free, absolutely free in, in many yeah. of these cases. It's just amazing, amazing stuff. So please go visit that, students, uh, for further study. Please enroll and, and take advantage of all the resources there at the Marges Centre and Credible Catholic. Uh, Father, you, uh, I mean, you, you, you have been in the public scene. Uh, you've been on the Larry King show. I noticed uh, with uh, Richard Hawkins, and uh, you've also been on the Today Show. And 
you know, you've done uh, various uh, public debates on on the, uh, proving the existence of God. Uh, uh, could you just touch the, the experiences there? Um, uh, how, how has that experience been? Well, the experience is, is terrific for me. Again, I find uh, much of the time that the, the difficulty that comes out in the debates is that there are far more errors of omission than commission. Mm. In other words, it's what people don't say um, that leads to these, uh, you know, uh, real difficulties. Uh, and as you probably know, um, uh, <laughs> Dr. Alexander Lincoln went to Stephen Hawking's uh, uh, 70th birthday party at Cambridge there, and uh, he, re he read his paper, uh, basically, uh, you know, saying that scientists really do have to reconcile themselves uh, to a beginning, because when you look at the board of Lincoln and Guth proof, plus the entropy evidence, it looks like you not only have to have a beginning of our universe, but uh, as the students know, a multiverse, a universe in the higher dimensional space of string theory, bouncing universes, et cetera, uh, that uh, looks like a beginning of physical reality itself is being required by physics itself. Now, if you leave that proof out, well, then uh, Richard Dawkins can get away with saying, um, you know, oh, gee, you know, I. I've not heard of any proof of God. Well, he may not have heard of it, but every physicist around has. And uh, Lincoln made sure that uh, everybody heard about it at Stephen Hawking's birthday party in Cambridge. By the way, uh, Lisa uh, uh, um, Gross, who's covering it for the, uh, for the New York Times and the New Scientist, um, you know, basically said it was the worst birthday present ever. So uh, <laughs> in any case, but uh, I yeah, I, I find that the real problem is... Uh, is uh, errors of omission. People just leave stuff out. And um, yes. this is happening all over the place. Now, some of the things like, you know, most scientists are atheists, those kinds of statements, they're just dead wrong commission errors. And uh, they're, they're factual errors, uh, which shouldn't be uh, uh, committed at all. But um, nevertheless, um, they, that's their present. But most of the time in the debates, it's uh, dragging out the evidence uh, to make the most complete case. And remember, the truth is dependent not just on the facts, but the truth is dependent on the most complete rendition and explanation of facts possible. And so if you, uh, the, as I always say, the one who has the most evidence and accounts for the most evidence wins. And that's the, the real turning point of the debate. Yeah, fan. Just curious, is Stephen Hawking's? Uh, did you ever have a conversation with him afterwards, or, or was that not not? Not with uh, Stephen, uh, Steve, because Stephen, uh, you know, at the time could not have conversations. Yeah. Um, he, he was very, very much limited in his speech, uh, and all those, um, you know, the, the the responses that he had, um, uh, he had them worked out prior to the debate, and so um, he, he is actually delivering it in his. Uh, you know, automated voice there that uh, yes. uh, is coming up. But at the same time, um, uh, alas, he, he couldn't uh, really have a conversation. His um, uh, co-author, Leonard Mladenov, um, uh, actually did that, the debate part for him. Uh, so in the studio there um, at, uh, you know, um, uh, CNN, um, uh, Larry King studio, uh, he was really, uh, Leonard Milanov was the representative there. Uh, but uh, Deepak Chopra, um, you know, was, was there too. Uh, and, uh, and I must say, uh, um, it was an interesting uh, debate uh, all the way around. And, um, um, you know, the, uh, again, it turns on what points you admit and what points you leave out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, mate, uh, so students, you can actually go online and see that uh, Father is actually on the Larry King Show to so check that out and also on the Today Show on another date. And, um, there's lots online if you wanted to see many of those. Uh, now, now, Father, it's interesting in this course, Faith and Science, an introduction to Faith and Science, um, we, we have this misconception that the church is against science, and that's why we wanted this course to happen. Uh, it, it's very much it's the opposite. And uh, could you tell us, I mean, many of our, these famous scientists that we come to know and love are actually Catholic priests. Could you yeah. touch on just a few of these famous ones? Yeah, uh, yeah, there are about, you know, the, a nice list has been put together. You can probably, I think, still get it on Wikipedia. Uh, oh. All you have to do is put on Wikipedia clergy scientists. And uh, I don't think it's much 
uh, 200 of them. Um, and it's a remarkable list, uh, more than 200, maybe 173 of them, whatever wow. it was, I forget the exact number. But uh, in any case, uh, um, I'm sure everybody's heard of Gregor Mendel, uh, who is the father of quantitative genetics. Uh, he was not only a priest, he was an abbot, a, an Augustinian abbot. And um, uh, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of um, uh, Father, well, you may not have heard of him, but everybody's heard of the Big Bang Theory. And yes. most people don't know that the Big Bang Theory was originally discovered in 1927 by a Catholic priest, uh, Father or now Monsignor Georges Lemaitre, uh, who was a colleague of Einstein's. And in 1927, uh, after publishing uh, the theory of the expanding universe, uh, by the way, based on the general theory of relativity, um, uh, it uh, came to pass that uh, that uh, this was um, uh, basically uh, um, uh, shown by Lemaitre and, and Hubble later on uh, to be 100% true. Um, so, uh, um, and finally, um, you know, Einstein agreed with it. At first, of course, Einstein said, oh, you know, uh, the, your mathematics is terrific, but your your, your physics is preposterous, so you imagine a universe expanding from a single point. And then, of course, it turns out that he, Lemaitre was right and Einstein was wrong. But we still have all kinds of, I mean, people may have heard of Lemaitre Walker space time or the Lemaitre constant and all kinds of things. That's a, that's a Catholic priest, Father George Lemaitre, one of the most uh, famous cosmologists uh, who ever lived, actually. And, um, and then um, many people maybe don't know this either, but uh, uh, Nicholas uh, um uh, Steno, um, who was a uh, uh, D Danish uh, uh, Copenhagen uh, bishop, and um, and uh, he is the father of contemporary strat stratigraphy, and um, uh, which is you know the geological you know. Uh, interpretation of the strata of the earth. You go down, you go, you know, you, you you rate the number of years back you're going with each layer and how you, you go through those sedimentary layers and so forth. Uh, that was uh, uh, also a Catholic priest and bishop uh, from Copenhagen, uh, uh, Nicholas Dano. And of course, I, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, think of, um, for example, uh, Nicholas Copernicus. Now, Nick, Nicholas Copernicus was not a priest. But he certainly was a cleric. He had taken minor orders in the Catholic Church and was a uh, first-rate canonist uh, in the Catholic Church. But Nicholas Copernicus, need I say more, the father of the heliocentric solar system, or at least the first mathematically, um, you know, uh, 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 proven, um, uh, not proven, but uh, mathematically demonstrated, way of justifying the heliocentric solar system, uh, that uh, the so-called Copernican revolution, um, that was a Catholic cleric. So, and by the way, there's like, like I said, 173 more, a lot of Jesuits among them. Wow, wow. So that, that, that would be fascinating for us to, to look at the list of all these famous scientists. Um, but why don't we, can we start then in our first question here? Uh, sure specifically and i'm sure many people are always asking the big bang theory um and i guess it, you know is it still a theory uh, and 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 where did this come from and how do we explain the big bang um is that um consistent with the catholic teaching or is it completely at odds um uh, could you talk about the big bang theory uh, as I just said, the Big Bang Theory was discovered and published by uh, the Catholic priest, uh, mm -hmm. Father Georges Lemaitre. Um, and of course, it's very consistent with Catholic theology. Um, uh, Catholic clergy and scientists uh, for years have, uh, have talked about it. The popes have certainly um, allowed the Big Bang Theory, uh, no question about it. Um, and the Big Bang Theory holds that uh, today we now have slightly uh, more accurate astronomical uh, findings than poor Father Lemaitre did, right? He was operating at Mount Wilson there just uh, above uh, Los Angeles. So uh, today we have, you know, tremendous satellite uh, telemetry and satellites uh, uh, that can, uh, you know, make much more precise observations of distant galaxies, galactic systems, and stars. So um, because of that, we now have a fairly good idea that the universe 
is about 13.8 billion years old, plus or minus 100 million years. Uh, that's been validated not just by astronomical observations, but also um, by the redshifting of, of uh, a universal constants. And that redshifting is a little hard to explain right now, um, but um, uh, that was discovered by uh, Hubble, uh, but it was also a validation of Lemaitre's uh, first constant. Uh, so the, the red shifting is also integral to the evidence. And then we have what's called uh, space-time ripples. So when you have the universe expanding as a whole, uh, you would expect that as the universe went through its uh, phases, um, you know, uh, you know, acceleration, slow down, acceleration, and then continuous slowing down, you're going to have some ripples in space time, uh, which is predicted by general theory of relativity. And sure enough, those very ripples uh, have been discovered and validated by the Planck satellite. Uh, but also we have, uh, um, you know, uh, evidence from the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe, uh, the WMAP satellite, as well as the two COBE satellites, Cosmic Background Explorer satellites. So these, uh, uh, the, the evidence is rather overwhelming. Um, and um, I, yeah, I, I just, you know, you've got a whole different evidential bases that are uh, put together in um, in um, uh, they, they come, the, the mathematics of all these different evidence sets uh, comes together very, very nicely around 13.8 billion years old, plus or minus 100 million years. Now, for many people um, that, that may have uh, read the Bible and, and read the creation, so this may sound alarming to them, you know, that we thought that the world was just created in six days. It, it, you know, God's rested on the seventh, and, and that's the story we're given. And, and mm -hmm. so... This hearing this for many Catholics uh, can be very difficult, right, Father? So as a Catholic priest, how do you reconcile what you've just said with mm -hmm. the creation account? Because I'm sure that's always an alarming thing to hear for the first time. Well, hang on. I thought the world was maybe only, only 6,000 years based mm -hmm. on biblical history. And then the creation story told us it was done in six days. Hang on. Uh, if God wanted to create it out of nothing just like that, he could, I'm sure. But what, what's... Could you just help us reconcile this? Yeah, no, good point. Um, well, I'll do it the same way Monsignor uh, Georges Lemaitre did, the one who discovered okay. the Big Bang Theory. Uh, basically, he goes back uh, to an encyclical. Well, first of all, there's a, an encyclical. There's an openness to this kind of thing when Lemaitre is writing in 1927, but then um, we see that um, in a very important encyclical of 1941 by Pope Pius the Twelfth. There's a, it's called Divino Aflante Spiritu. Uh, essentially, Pope um, Pius XII made a, a very, very important distinction. He said the purpose of sacred scripture is to give sacred truths necessary for salvation. The purpose of the sciences is to give as complete a description and explanation on the basis of hypothetical, deductive, and mathematical reasoning of the physical universe. So uh, now he goes on to say that it is not the point of sacred scripture to give as complete an explanation through mathematical, uh, you know, um, uh, mathematical and hypothetical deductive reasoning of the physical universe. That's not what sacred scripture does. And by the way, what uh, uh, physics does, right? Uh, um, uh, yeah, I mean, what um, uh, scripture does cannot be done by science. So, say, you know, science cannot talk about sacred truths necessary for salvation. So these two domains are completely different, said Pope Pius XII. And then he goes on to say the methodologies used are quite different as well. So biblical analysis and hermeneutics, which is what we do with respect to sacred scripture, uh, that's the method used to, to discern you know, the, the best interpretation we can get of what the biblical author intended at the time. And then of course, hypothetical deductive and mathematical reasoning is what we use in physics. So it's two methods aiming at two objectives. So um, would you say then that uh, for Pope Pius uh, the 12th, that the, the universe is 6,000 years old um, according to biblical history, but is that really, um, uh, you know, the important dimension of, uh, of the, the sacred text that we're supposed to be looking at? Is that even within the scope of the objective 
of uh, the, the scripture? And the answer is no. The scripture is not there to tell us how old the universe is. That's a scientific question. And, and, and of course, um, you know, that what's really important in the sacred scripture is the following. Uh, number one, the biblical author, uh, this is, you know, 550 BC, the biblical author is trying to respond to rival myths that are out there in um, his uh, area. And he hears, uh, you know, okay, there are many gods. And so he's got to redress that. He's got to say, no, no, there's one God. Can science tell us that there's only one God? Well, there's a perfectly good proof of God, but scientific evidence cannot validate that there is one God. A philosophical proof can show you un very, very well that there is only one and only one unrestricted reality. That's a very uh, easy proof to do. And um, that uh, one and only one unrestricted reality can show you that an unrestricted reality is necessary in anything which exists through itself. So you can actually prove one God logically, philosophically, but it's also part of revelation. That's a truth necessary for salvation. But science, science can't do that. Secondly, in the rival myths, the biblical author is facing the fact that his people are looking out and going, well, there's a sea god. You know, the, the Babylonians have a sea god and the Egyptians have a sun god. And there's this god and that god, which are all identified with these natural objects. What's the biblical author have to do for necessary for salvation? He's got to show that no, no, there's only one God. Everything else is a creature. There's no such thing as a sun God, a sea God, a mountain God, etc. So all these things, right, uh, are, are merely the inventions of, of, you know, kind of myth. Uh, the, the real truth is there's one and only one God everything else is a creature. But then he goes on, he, he, he's, he has to answer the, the rival myths about human beings. Uh, basically the rival myths, right? Gilgamesh, Epic and so, what are they saying? They're saying, well, human beings are essentially cannon fodder on the chessboard of the gods. They're having a great old time having fun with the demolition of human beings, you know, and they're, they're playing games and we're caught up in the middle of this divine extravagance uh, uh, that holds us, uh, you know, as, as of no account. Whereas the biblical author comes and says, no, no, that's wrong. Human beings are made in the very image and likeness of God. Now, could, of course, a scientist make that statement? Of course, a scientist can't make that statement. Of course, a scientist can't make these statements that the biblical, and, you know, the idea is, is matter good or evil? Well, the biblical author has to respond, right? Because, you know, rival myths are saying matter's evil, the world's evil. But the biblical author tells us after every day of creation, and, and God saw that it was good. So it's a de declaration of the goodness of the uh, uh, of the material world, the physical world, etc. So now th that's all uh, really important. Science can't do that. That's the job of the Bible. But on the other hand, huh, the Bible can't be telling us right. A sacred a text devoted to sacred truth should not be telling us without a scientific physical methodology how old the universe is. That's really a scientific question, said Pope Pius XII, and we should allow scientists to answer that. And it looks like the answer is 13.8 billion years old. Um, and so that, that would be just like one example of, of the, the differentiation between the two methodologies. Thank you very much for clarifying. It is important that we're not looking at the, the scriptures as a scientific book. It is, right. it is a spirit, it's for spiritual truths and our salvation. Right. And so there's a big distinction there. Um, uh, I mean, very quickly, the, uh, we, you know, we've seen lots of timelines biblical timelines and they go through a genealogy if you like um yeah. from adam to jesus and they go and trace uh these characters now these characters uh the details sort of show you where they're from what region in the world they're from it shows you uh you know the world power at the time and it sort mm -hmm. of puts it in real secular history so i mm -hmm. guess it uh is it safe to say then that the these genealogies that we know of uh, from scripture are they sort of way after um, when we're talking about the age of the earth is one question. Um, another mm -hmm. question is age of, I guess, humans. Mm -hmm. And then another question would be since uh, when do we say Adam started mm -hmm. 
And then that's where we pick it up. Uh, and so then Adam and, and Seth, and then you go through the line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, so basically, you, you could you tell us a bit about, uh, is it safe to say there is roughly uh, 6,000 years of, of biblical human history? Or is that just not even a, a question at all? I mean, these, these um, as we can trace back the genealogy of Jesus, could you comment on that just while we're here? So. Yeah, uh, there's definitely um, a lot of truth in the, in the genealogies. Um, certainly in the human, the, 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 the verifiable kinds of, of, of parts. Now, are, is, is the gene, are the genealogies complete? Uh, that probably, there, there are probably a lot of people left out of the genealogies. But the ones that are there in the genealogy, they're pretty accurate. There's a lot of real good accuracy in the genealogies. Now, of course, people didn't write down the genealogies. Genealogies were done in what's called oral tradition. Mm -hmm. And so people had to remember these things. But yes, the, the, the genealogies are accurate as far as they go. Uh, I think there's a lot of, you know, obviously there are, you know, groups of people that are left out and so forth um, that, you know, really difficult to, to ascertain. Um, because they're not necessarily uh, in the biblical um, uh, books. The biblical, there just weren't biblical books written about certain generations of people. However, be that as it may, there is general accuracy to those genealogies. And uh, the second thing that's um, uh, really important, though, it's, you know, when you get back to Seth and you're just about, you know, uh, at, 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 you know just before Adam, uh, the one thing we have to remember um, is that uh, our genetic ancestors, uh, who we call mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam, right? They, um, yes. uh, mitochondrial Eve uh, lived 200,000 years ago and Y chromosome Adam lived 200,000 years ago. Every single person in the world still today shares mitochondrial Eve, Eve's mitochondrial DNA. So you and I, it doesn't matter where in the world, we were born in Africa and Arctica, it wouldn't matter. Uh, it, it, you know, we'd all have our common ancestor, uh, mitochondrial Eve, we would have her genetic um, remnant, um, uh, you know, my, called mitochondrial DNA, uh, DNA in our cells. So that that would be the thing that every man around the world, again, Africa, Antarctica, Europe, wherever, right? That doesn't Australia even. Uh, I'm just kidding. But uh, all of them, <laughs> uh, every man would have the remnant of a Y chromosome atom, which is the Y chromosome itself. So that comes from our specific genetic ancestor. And so we know they lived about 200,000 years ago. Um, but I think basically our ensouled ancestors, uh, where our soul comes into being, is about 70,000 years ago. Because our genetic ancestors kind of hung around the border of Namibia and Angola for about 130,000 years. And um, they didn't do much. I mean, they cracked coconuts, ate bananas, and kind of did, you know, um, I guess campfire things, but um, they sure didn't go anywhere. They certainly didn't develop mathematics, but 70,000 years ago, we start seeing a proliferation of evidence, counting sticks and primitive abacuses, you know, that are, uh, you know, starting to develop. We start to see, uh, um, you know, uh, that the human beings are not only burying their dead, they're burying their dead with divine trinkets and all kinds of beautiful adornments for the body and all kinds of things that could be useful in their life beyond showing that they obviously have a sense of divinity, transcendence, the afterlife, Right, they're bringing with food and weapons, you know, uh, you know that they may need, you know, in the afterlife, etc. So th th there's, you know, all of a sudden, Homo mathematicus has come, Homo religiosus has come, and then, uh, you know, the the, the um, uh, musical and aesthetic uh, part. So Homo aestheticus, right? The bone flute, seventy thousand years ago, you got these bone flutes, you've got these uh, terrific cave drawings, even you know, Homo symbolicus, Homo aestheticus, right? You know, all of these things, a the visual. Arts, the, the painted jewelry, the, the bone flutes, the drums, you know, 70,000 years prior to that time, forget about it. I mean, we're talking coconutsville here. So the, the, the main thing then, you know, last, you know, this huge geographical, you know, explosion. Uh, for, they hang around for 130,000 years ago. Um, 
oh, excuse me, 130,000 years and border of Angola and Namibia, and suddenly they're blasting up to the northern uh, parts of uh, Africa. They're crossing the straits. They're going over, uh, you know, the Mediterranean. They're they're going into China. They're going into Europe. They're going all the way to the northernmost parts of Europe. They cross over the Arctic land bridge, go into the uh, the um, uh, Western Hemisphere, the uh, into the uh, um, um, Western Hemisphere, go all the way down to the southernmost tip of, of uh, South America. Uh, they do this in 10,000 years. And for 130,000 years ago, they were just there like bumps on a log in Africa. No way. Something's happened. These people are categorically different. They're not the same people that their uh, previous genetic ancestors were. And by the way, when they were going along the route, they were not only religious and mathematical, but they became linguistically sophisticated, syntactically sophisticated, developing a language group in almost every place that humans landed with the same genetic origin, same genetic heritage. They were, they were uh, uh, developing conceptual languages, whole libraries of thought. And well, of course, write, written language goes it's a lot longer a lot later um, than 70,000 years ago. But uh, essentially, though, um, we see all of these developments that are going on full blast. We see the primitive etchings there. We see taboos and social restrictions and the way that these villages are built. The villages obviously show a capacity for irrigation, show signs of, of technology. And, and organization, uh, which was not there previously. So uh, all I can tell you is uh, uh, I think uh, we got a soul about 70,000 years ago. And I would say that ensouled Adam and Eve probably happened right about then. So then getting back to your question, well, if that's the case, uh, then how can you say that there's only 6,000 years of genealogy represented? And again, it's the old omissions. Um, what, were there probably, you know, uh, uh, a whole lot of generations, uh, maybe about a hundred thousand uh, uh, generations, um, uh, you know, of or not hundred thousand, but uh, maybe about thirty thousand generations of uh, people uh, in our genetic ancestors um, who were not ensouled, and then probably starting with uh, with uh, ensouled Adam and Eve seventy thousand years ago, they're probably just you know. 10,000 generations of people who are just unaccounted for, right? So yeah, you've got yeah. uh, at least 5,000 who are just not accounted for. And then boom, uh, all of a sudden we've got written history. All of a sudden we've got religious uh, revelation that makes the accounting of genealogy very significant uh, because of course it gets back not only to or, uh, racial heritage but religious heritage and now all of a sudden the counting of, of generations and so forth becomes very very important yeah okay fantastic and i guess it's always important to keep in mind again the, the idea that scripture was not intended to give us the, the scientific evidence here but uh what what helps is you know we hear the story of uh the famous stories of the flood um, uh, and then after the flood, yeah, the, uh, the earth is repopulated. And, you know, that, that, that raises many questions for people who, was there an actual flood? Uh, and all these common questions that happen, uh, these events in the Bible, did they actually happen? And I know there's debate either side, um, and even among good Catholics, if you like. Um, but how, how far do you take that? Some Do we say that these events happen may not we don't have the exact details of the events but we have enough to say some sort of type of event would have happened um, oh, yeah yeah there was a the flood uh, absolutely and the flood flood probably happened about 40 45,000 40,000 years ago but okay. there's obviously a very long and strong tradition of the devastating effects of this flood I mean, it was uh, even called a Diluvian area, era. So, I mean, mm. you know, you're basically talking about a whole era in which uh, the, you know, the, the earth is pretty much covered with water. Uh, you do have survivors, uh, you know, that, um, uh, you know, that came out of it. But the, the living memory of that is so strong. It endured a long, long time. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, that, uh, that probably is a... The floods a fact. Uh, now the, all of the um, uh, the dimensions of the, the Noah narrative. Uh, well, you know that's a, a lot of the biblical author uh, is is uh, kind of uh, inscripted there. But certainly there must have been some kind of a patriarch 
who had mm -hmm. a great deal of influence uh, in this uh, flood. We could, I think the biblical author names him Noah, um, you know, uh, obviously a Hebrew name, um, you know, uh, whether that person way back then had such a name is uh, difficult to ascertain. But at, at the same time, uh, do I believe in a deluvian era? I do. Do I believe that uh, there uh, obviously were human people who remembered it? Absolutely. Uh, was it etched into the living memory uh, or, you know, the first generations and then uh, into the oral traditions thereafter? Absolutely. Uh, was there, were there significant kind of patriarchal figures who helped to reorganize society after the flood, similar to a Noah? Absolutely. Uh, I have no doubt about it, but did he have a a Hebrew name named Noah, um, uh, you know, uh, I would say that's more the biblical author, um, yes. you know, um, saying that. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I do think there's historicity behind it for sure. Thank you very much for clarifying that because I think it's important for us uh, uh, in whatever field we are to, to understand this and when we're reading scripture to, to see sense of it. But now, mm -hmm. what about the question now, um, evolution? Now, we've touched on the Big Bang Theory. We took evolution now. Uh, and you've just talked about the, the sort of the age of the earth. Um, you talked about now um, sort of uh, w what we see of over 200,000 years of, of, of human history. And there was a difference uh, sort of 70,000 years ago. Um, tell us about evolution then. Um, and, and I guess are there, uh, are there different types of evolution? And, and what is the Catholic understanding? What can be reconciled with our faith and, and what what, what do we understand about revolution, evolution? Mm -hmm. uh, so the same Pope, uh, Pope Pius XII, was the first one to write about this in a book called, uh, I'm having a book, in an encyclical called Humani Generis. Now, um, uh, in that uh, encyclical, that goes back, I believe, to 1950, maybe 51. Uh, but in any case, uh, in that encyclical, Pope Pius XII, um, declares that Catholics can believe in evolution. What Catholics can't believe is in a purely materialistic, that is to say, biophysical uh, evolutionary process that would either discard or negate the existence of a unique uh, soul created by God for each individual human being. Now, um, in, in a, uh, you know, there's a ton of evidence from peer-reviewed medical studies of near-death experiences, as well as uh, this new phenomenon called terminal lucidity uh, that actually show, uh, I think, with uh, excellent empirical method, that um, the strong, strong likelihood that you have a transphysical soul that will survive bodily death. I don't think that's beyond the pale at all of science today. And I think if anybody takes an honest look at the information uh, that I present in some uh, in this uh, master teacher program, um, you know, if you uh, take a look at that, uh, it's it's pretty clear um, that we we very likely do have a transphysical soul uh, on the basis of scientific evidence. Uh, that's a little beyond my scope, but here's what Pope Pius says. So long as you don't exclude the existence of such a soul created by God uniquely for each individual, then Catholics are fine uh, with evolution. We just can't believe in what's called a purely materialistic evolutionary process. Now, just three quick things uh, about that. Uh, the first thing is, is, um, nobody today, really, among scientists, not even Thomas Nagel, who is basically your um, agnostic hyphen atheistic kind of guy, um, he just looks at it and goes, uh, he, he just wrote a book a while back called Mind and Cosmos. Why uh, the neo-Darwinian materialistic conception of evolution is almost certainly wrong. Now, that's basically... Okay. Um, you know, that's, that's not coming from, you know, Bob Spitzer, the, the Jesuit, you know, um, uh, this is coming from Thomas Nagel. So uh, my, my point is that um, I don't think anybody believes it because, frankly, the scientific facts won't sustain it. There just simply is not enough time to give rise to an evolutionary process to a being as sophisticated as a human being. It's just not even remotely possible. So uh, if you look at even the number of quantum perturbations uh, over the whole course of the 
the lifetime of the Earth or the lifetime of the universe for that matter. So if you just took 13.8 billion years and you multiplied it out, right? So you, uh, you know, times 365 times 60 times 60 uh, times 10 to the 40th for the number of quantum perturbations per second, uh, you know, you could multiply it out and say, well, could, could you explain the evolution of, of a single part of a human being? Uh, for example, you know, maybe the, uh, uh, the, the protein cell synthesis uh, uh, there, uh, or, you know, even the development of amino acids in that amount of time with that amount of perturbations? Absolutely not. Impossible. There's just not enough time, <laughs> not even remotely enough time. Uh, to do this. So like I said, a, a lot of secular scientists don't even hold to it. Uh, as I said, you know, the vast, uh, the, or today, about 51% of scientists are uh, theistic, that is to say they're believers in God. Um, uh, and um, uh, as I said, with the young scientists, it's about 66%. Uh, now, most of them, of course, as scientists are going to believe in some form of evolutionary process uh, that have certainly been approved by the church. Um, uh, normally, you know, scientists split it into three kinds of theistic evolution. One is called nomogenesis, right? So nomogenesis um, uh, basically means like Francis Collins, right? The, the, uh, the uh, doctor who's the head of the uh, Human Genome Project at the National Institute of Health in the United States. Uh, this is like one of the biggest, you know, uh, projects in, in, in the world. Well, Francis Collins is obviously a very good Christian. Now, he's what you would call a nomogenesis guy. Uh, he believes that God front-loaded all of the laws, every single solitary thing that would be required to allow for the development of a human being uh, over the course of, um, you know, about 4.6 uh, billion years, puts, uh, puts it all in there. Um, you know, in the universe, the earth is about 4.6 billion years old. Our universe is 13.8 billion years old. So even puts it in at the beginning of the Big Bang, everything's uh, front loaded. Now you've got other people who like there's your priest, a Jesuit priest by the name of Pierre uh, Teilhard de Chardin. Um, he believed that God was at the sort of the end of the process, as it were. He's what uh, Aristotle would call the final cause, the omega point that's drawing everything uh, to its fruition. And that's called orthogenesis. And then you've got uh, people like Michael Polanyi. And Michael Polanyi um, would, for example, uh, he, he's the very famous chemist. He sort of has an orthonomogenesis. Uh, he, he believes that God did front load, but then God continues to be, uh, as it were, uh, present as a drawing force, uh, like an omega point, like a final cause uh, drawing uh, creation to its fulfillment. Now, whatever case you have, I mean, most scientists will fit into one of those three categories. Uh, if they are Christian or if they are um, uh, theistic scientists. So, uh, and as I said, that's the majority of scientists. So I, I would say those are the, the options uh, there. And Pope John Paul II, now St. John Paul II, uh, also uh, uh, you know, wrote a, an allocution, actually a letter uh, to the Papal Academy of Sciences, I think back in 1998. Uh, and in it, he says that evolution is now more than um, a, a hypothesis. It is a very well-grounded theory, uh, and it needs to be taken seriously. And he wrote this, to, like I said, to the Papal Academy of Sciences. And by the way, the Catholic Church is the only church that has its own Academy of Scientists with all kinds of Nobel Prize winners in it. So um, this is, a, you know, we're the only church that has a series of observatories uh, all over the world. And uh, <coughs> I don't have to tell you, uh, you know, <coughs> we've got um, a lot of research and think tanks and universities all over the world, 1,760 of them, uh, that are reflecting on these kinds of questions uh, with an appropriate scientific methodology. So um, does the Catholic Church allow for evolution? Certainly it does. What it doesn't allow for is a purely materialistic evolution, um, which uh, excludes the existence of a unique physical soul for each human being created by God. Wow, thank you. I mean, just to understand the different aspects of evolution there, um, mm -hmm. yeah, is mind-blowing. Um, uh, might be after hearing all that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the common thing we see: uh, <clears throat> did humans come? Uh, do humans come from apes? <laughs> Something so basic. 
uh, after hearing what you're saying, I understand the answer would be no. We don't come from apes. No, you can't completely come from apes. Uh, though part of our embodiment um, might have uh, developed uh, from you know um, a, a line like apes. Um, uh, definitely, human beings um, uh, have um, not only um, uh, biological differences from apes, which are very significant and difficult to explain uh, because of the problem of what's called zygote reductionism. But the, nevertheless, the, that's one thing. But secondly, uh, apes don't have physical um, transphysical souls. Human mm -hmm. beings do have transphysical souls, and that makes all the difference. Uh, by the way, chimpanzees, you know, uh, even Nim Chimsky, a highly trained uh, chimpanzee, right, uh, uh, learned uh, 120 words in American Sign Language, uh, even. Um, Nim Chimsky couldn't, can't even pass the simplest syntax test that a one-year-old can get, you know, the, to differentiate between dog bites man and man bites dog, right, a so-called Noam Chomsky syntax test. Uh, the chimp can't do it. He has no sense of predication, no sense of direct object, indirect object, because he has no what you would call a class theoretical uh, uh, language. He, he, he can't form a, you know, um, uh, you know, a direct object or an indirect object or a predicate, uh, which represents a class of objects. All the chimpanzee has is perceptual ideas. Uh, we have, as human beings, conceptual ideas that require a soul. Uh, by the way, mathematics, there's a great proof by a mathematician by the name of Kurt Gödel, um, you know, a very, very famous mathematician who has what's called the uh, Gödelian um, incompleteness theorems. And in there, there's a, there's a proof that human beings do mathematics in a way that cannot be done by physical processes alone, uh, say in a Turing machine, that is to say a computer, an artificial intelligence machine, or by mere physical processes in the brain. It's one of the most uh, difficult questions. I mean, there are people all over the place trying to you know, explain these things in terms of microtubular, uh, you know, uh, interactions with quantum theory and so, uh, you know, quantum computation and so forth. But all of these things are just falling on deaf ears. Gettle just continues to emerge as supreme, defying just say, without a soul, you're not going to do mathematics like human beings do mathematics. Because all artificial intelligence machines have to derive uh, their mathematical formulae from previous sets of axioms and, and theorems that have been given to them. In other words, you need a previous set of algorithms uh, to make recourse to, to develop the next set. Human beings don't do that at all. We see a problem that can't be solved by a previous set of algorithms. We leap right into the blue, develop a whole new set of mathematics, have nothing to do with the previous set of algorithms, and then we prove it. Uh, we, we show that this is true independent of the previous set of algorithms. Go figure. I mean, there's something about our grasp of mathematical intelligibility that's unbelievable. And by the way, uh, we're the only beings around that think about the transcendental desires. You know, the the you know perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. But that betrays that we have an awareness of perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. And if we do, just how did we get that from the physical processes in our brain, uh, looking around us in a physical world, which are all algorithmically finite structures? How did we get to perfect truth, perfect being, perfect goodness, perfect love? Per you know, are you kidding me? Perfect beauty? There's no correspondence whatsoever. Where did we get that from? Well, we certainly didn't get it from a physical brain looking at a physical finite, uh, algorithmically finite structured world. So there's, again, um, you know, looks like we got a soul. Looks like we got a soul from these near-death experiences. Looks like we got a soul from the, the studies of terminal lucidity. By the way, those are peer-reviewed, good, really good peer-reviewed medical journals, near-death experience, terminal lucidity. I mean, there's all kinds of evidence that we have such soul. And of course, I believe that each one of us is given that soul by God at the moment of fertilization. And the reason I believe that, by the way, there's a very uh, world famous um, uh, uh, anatomist, uh, you know, uh, um, um, Sir John Eccles. And Sir John Eccles uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, uh, for, well, for a whole different area, but he wrote a book. Uh, that showed that human identity cannot be reduced to a set of physical processes. You can never get to the self-conscious human identity uh, by trying to reduce it to a set of physical processes. Uh, by the way, this is a, a, the uh, uh, a theory that David Chalmers over at um, 
uh, Cambridge, uh, no, over, over to Oxford, uh, has, has said he's written a really comprehensive book that pushes Sir John Eccles to the next level. But the point, of course, is in order to get that kind of self-conscious human identity, if you can't reduce it to physical processes, you're talking about transphysical processes and structures, and transphysical means a soul. So, mm -hmm. of course, again, we've got that, uh, that, um, that uh, indication uh, that we do have a soul and is being validated all the time in contemporary research. So uh, no need to, to have the material. Not only does the materialistic uh, neo-Darwinian theory, uh, not only doesn't it work mathematically in terms of the number of uh, perturbations and the amount of time required, it just plain doesn't work because it doesn't explain anything about what human beings do in terms of aesthetics, in terms of mathematics, in terms of syntactically significant linguistics. Uh, by the way, it doesn't explain near-death experiences or terminal lucidity either. So um, for all intents and purposes, we're right at the, uh, the point where I think we can say with great certitude, yeah, we have a soul and a body. The body can be uh, uh, you know, uh, explained by an evolutionary process. A soul it's outside of a biophysical system. It's got to be outside of an evolutionary process. It'll never be able to be reduced to evolution. Uh, Neo-Darwinianism in a materialistic sense, therefore, is incoherent. Well, thank you so much for that. Sure. And that answered my question about evidence of a transphysical, transphysical soul. Uh, pretty much uh, you've said it right <laughs> there. <laughs> sure. uh, can we talk about then um, Jesus? Um, mm -hmm. So is there evidence for Jesus and then... How do we go to the next step? Not just the fact that a, a man named Jesus existed, but his divinity as well. Yeah. Um, can we uh, go there? Yeah, there, no, there's a good question. I mean, first of all, we do have extra biblical sources of Jesus, right? So, um, and, and they're, by the way, they're really nice sources, uh, good sources for our purposes, I should say, but they were actually hostile sources to Jesus, uh, but they were uh, hostile sources contemporaneous with Jesus. And so if you, uh, if you take a look at that, um, um, for example, you know, uh, Flavius Josephus. Uh, Flavius Josephus is a Jewish historian, very good one, uh, by the way, and he's writing for the Roman emperor. Uh, he, he certainly is not a friend of Christianity. Um, uh, and so he, he writes about Jesus, but he gives a, an honest testimony there. He says, you know, there was a, at that time, you know, a, a man named Jesus. And he goes on to explain three things that uh, we know. Now, so there, there are some texts of Flavius Josephus that, that may have some additions in it. But here are the uh, what scholars consider to be the three interesting things that he says. Number one, he says that Jesus did perform miracles. And that is a remarkable thing. Uh, all the, every scholar, um, you know, who's, uh, you know, dispassionate about this says, yeah, that's part of the original text, that Jesus performed miracles, that he was considered to be a wise man, that he was put to death uh, by the procurator Pontius Pilate. Um, and so uh, uh, we get a very good uh, testimony from a person who is essentially a hostile witness, contemporaneous, you know, in other words, uh, living near the time of Jesus. We have another fellow who's a Roman historian by the name of Cornelius Tacitus. And uh, Tacitus also, go, uh, he doesn't talk about Jesus's miracles or wisdom or anything of that nature, uh, but he does uh, say that he did suffer the extreme penalty, that's crucifixion, under the procurator Pontius Pilate in, in, in the reign of Tiberius. So we, we do have that uh, from, again, a Roman historian, very hostile to Christianity. Uh, in fact, Tacitus was so hostile to Christianity, he basically said, well, you know, uh, Rome is a place where all these repulsive things uh, find their home and come to rest. And he, what he means by that is Christianity is one of those repulsive things. So he expresses his hostility at the very point he's talking about Christus. Uh, he's talking about the, uh, this person who was uh, crucified um, uh, by the procurator punch file. So we do have that. We, the Babylonian Talmud is interesting too, uh, because in the Babylonian Talmud, uh, again, uh, uh, near the time of Jesus, uh, we see that there is a testimony um, about you know, Jesus, but they claim that the reason that Jesus was uh, you know, purported to have done these miracles 
um, and exorcisms was because he was a sorcerer. Uh, does that sound like anything uh, that you've heard before? Absolutely. In our own scriptures, the enemies of Jesus say uh, he casts out demons by the power of the Beelzebub. Now, you have to think to yourself, well, why in the world uh, would uh, the Pharisees accuse him of casting out demons by the power of the Beelzebub? Because they have no other way of explaining his prolific ministry of exorcisms. In other words, the, when you start saying, oh, he's doing this by the power of Beelzebub, you're admitting he's doing it. He's doing exorcisms. He's doing miracles. You're admitting that the ministry is so prolific that you can't deny that he's doing it. So you've got to find another reason uh, to explain it. So you're going to say, ah, he, would, he did this because of the power of Beelzebub. And of course, the same thing with the accusation of sorcery. It's an, it, you know, an acknowledgement that he actually is doing the miracles in the exorcism. You're just saying he's a sorcerer instead of saying he's the son of God. And Jesus responded anyway to the old charge of sorcery. Uh, can, a nation, can a kingdom uh, uh, divided against itself stand? Can Satan actually be casting out Satan and have his kingdom last? Hardly. Uh, that's not only a self-refuting contradiction, but uh, at the same time, it's ridiculous. So um, anyway, I, I would say that's kind of where you see a lot of historical sources uh, lining up that are extra biblical. They're hostile. They're contemporaneous with Jesus. And they certainly show that uh, uh, he not only existed, but that it is likely he was performing miracles. It's likely that he was very famous. It's likely that he was persecuted under uh, the procurator Pontius Pilate, and some people considered him wise. Now, can we go beyond that uh, in terms of getting some kind of extra biblical testimony uh, for Jesus's existence and even his crucifixion and resurrection in detail? I would submit to you that we can uh, with an artifact uh, that is called the Shroud of Turin. Mm. And um, this uh, shroud um, uh, is it's a 14 uh, foot uh, long piece of linen, and it's a, uh, a quite remarkable, actually. Um, but uh, on it, there is a uh, an image, a perfect photographic uh, three dimensional negative image that's emblazoned on a non photographically sensitive linen cloth. And in addition to that perfect three-dimensional negative photographic image, you also have blood stains. Now, um, uh, first of all, I got to get to the dating problem, and then I'll go into the blood and the resurrection very briefly uh, with you. But with respect first to the, uh, to the dating, uh, 1988 uh, carbon dating was done on the shroud, showing that the shroud uh, seemingly uh, uh, dated back to the 1500s. Uh, that has now been seriously debunked. Uh, Dr. Ray Rogers, who is the head of thermal uh, uh, thermochemistry uh, out there in Los Alamos labs, you know, where the atomic bomb and all was developed. But anyway, he's out at Los Alamos and the head of a, of a journal called Thermochemica, one of the foremost journals of thermochemistry in the world, showed that the actual sample that was taken uh, and given to the labs was taken from a place on the shroud um, that uh, was burned um, during the fire of Chambéry. And we know that the sisters had actually woven um, some threads in there. Well, in the 1978 uh, uh, investigation of the shroud, scientific investigation of the shroud, um, uh, little sticky tapes were taken from each practically a millimeter of the, of, of the Shroud of Turin. Very easy to identify places where threads could have come from. And so uh, Ray Rogers got some of those samples uh, and then he was able to analyze uh, the, the, um, uh, the fibers and the fibrils that had come from that uh, part of the Shroud and showed that cotton fiber was actually uh, woven in with the linen cloth. Remember, the Shroud is linen. There's no cotton in it. But in the place where the sample was taken, there was co co uh, cotton uh, interwoven with it. And in addition, that cotton was dyed um, uh, with a gum dye mordant that was available in the Middle Ages. And we know that the sisters had dyed um, you know, the, the, the threads to match the, the color of the linen uh, on the shroud. So it uh, very, very much, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, uh, Rogers denied uh, 
um, the possibility that this this data could be uh, uh, accurate because it, it clearly contains uh, the remnants of other threads from a later period uh, manifest by the cotton and the gum dimordant. Uh, in addition to that, though, um, uh, another uh, group, uh, Dr. Tristan Casabianca and his uh, uh, group, uh, actually had asked the British Museum countless times uh, to um, uh, be able to get the raw data from, uh, you know, just do a statistical analysis of it, uh, to get the raw data from uh, from the archives of the British Museum. They did not let them have it. Not until 2018 did they finally release this. This is like 30 years after the carbon dating in 1988. Finally, they got a hold of it, did the statistical analysis of, of the uh, of the um, raw data and found that there was so much stratification and variegation uh, in, inside those samples that it manifested obviously there's kind of some admixture of threads from different eras that are present in that sample uh, which invalidated it for uh, dating the, the shroud to a medieval uh, era. Uh, by the way, since that time um, a variety of uh, dating tests have been done that show um, that the shroud probably originated around 50 AD, uh, plus or minus about 150 years. So uh, what were these tests? Uh, Fourier transformed infrared spectroscopy, a Raman laser spectroscopy, a, mechani a mechanical compressibility and tension test, and a vanillin test, which is an enzyme that decays over the course of time uh, and, and can actually be measured for the, you know, the, its presence compared to the age uh, of, for example, a fabric. Uh, so uh, what we see is that it's very likely that the shroud originated in about 50 AD. And when they do another carbon dating, when they actually take pieces of the shroud that have not been contaminated by a fire, and they actually take a look at these things uh, from seven or eight different places on the shroud, I'll bet anything that they correspond to the Fourier transformed infrared spectroscopy, et cetera. So I'm pretty sure that that's gonna happen. By the way, the coins on the man's eyes are perfectly visible, and there are four enigmas on those coins. They're Roman leptons that go back about 2000 years. And of course, uh, these uh, Roman leptons, uh, the ones on the man's eyes have four enigmas that are only present on one minting of those coins that we have, uh, that is only present on uh, one minting of coins. We've got um, six instances of them in all the numismatic collections in the world of these Roman leptons with these enigmas, and all of them come from where? from Jerusalem in a special minting by Pontius Pilate in 29 AD, perfectly visible on the eyelids of the man on the shroud. And the correspondence, of course, with the face cloth of Oviedo is too much for you to get into today, but I think we can uh, very safely say that the 1988 carbon dating has been completely debunked. It's very likely that the shroud goes back to the time of Jesus. Now, what's so significant about this shroud of Turin? By the way, it's the most scientifically investigated historical artifact ever in the world. There's none uh -huh. other like it. So, I mean, and it's, by the way, the most unique image that has ever been produced on any historical art artifact in the world. There's nothing like it. It has absolutely no explanation. How do you get a 3D image in a perfect photographic negative how do you get this um, on a non-photographically sensitive linen cloth? I'll explain that in two minutes. But before I get to the image, which of course gives us uh, you know, um, evidence of the resurrection, let me just give uh, a sense of what that blood evidence indicates. That, uh, first of all, how do we know it's blood? I mean, people like Macron, Macron you know, uh, came along and, and basically said, ah, this is red ochre, this is dye, this is paint, you know. Well, uh, you know, news flash. Every single blood stain on that shroud has genuine hemoglobin. Red ochre uh, uh, paint does not have hemoglobin. Every single one of these uh, blood stains has AB positive blood, state, uh, blood type. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, paint doesn't have any B positive blood type. Uh, every single one of these blood stains also has um, uh, a partial DNA profile. Uh, partial DNA profiles don't exist in paint. And by the way, every single one of those blood stains, interestingly enough, has an admixture of creatinine and ferritin, two enzymes which only synthesize when somebody is experiencing a polytrauma. Now, isn't that interesting? In other words, the guy's being tortured and tormented to death. 
okay, if that's the case, um, then I think we can say with fair reliability that this is genuine blood. Let's uh, not uh, get into the, uh, we'll get into the uh, ferritin and creatinine in just a moment. Uh, the, the main point though is what's so interesting about these blood stains is it conforms to the unique crucifixion event that uh, you know occurred with Jesus. So, uh, and, and when kids hear this, uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely mind blowing because when adults like me hear it, it's mind blowing. Uh, first of all, this is a Roman crown. Uh, you know, that, that it's used. It's not a medieval crown that goes around the, you know, the, the crown of the head. It goes over the top of the head. Now that, uh, who, who, you know, medieval forger would not known this. Yet uh, he's wearing a Roman crown uh, very clearly. Uh, it's right over the top of the head. And by the way, a crown of thorns, we only have <clears throat> one crucifixion event in the whole of uh, human history that has a crown of thorns. Um, uh, that's Jesus's. And this particular uh, um, uh, shroud linen has that crown of thorns. Uh, secondly, there is a uh, very clearly indicated hole in the man's side. The hole has a triangular, uh, uh, you know, kind of entry uh, wound. And it goes up between uh, the fourth and the fifth ribs. It goes up at a 45 degree angle into the uh, uh, pericardial cavity uh, up there uh, in the, of this man. Now, if, if you are dying of crucifixion, right? If you're, you're, you're trying to breathe, you're asphyxiating, right? Uh, and you're trying to breathe. And of course, all this water is just, just coming right up into the uh, you know, pericardial cavity. So you, you're, uh, um, uh, you know, this, this uh, uh, spear hole goes right at that angle, right into the pericardial cavity. And of course, what would have flowed out? a liquid that looked like water, clear liquid, as well as blood go from the spear going directly into heart, into the heart thereafter. So if you if you really think about it for a second, you can say, whoa, you know, um, uh, that's pretty uh, interesting indicator uh, of something unique to Jesus's crucifixion, where the century, remember a uh, 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 centurion, uh, 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 places the sword in Jesus's side and out flowed blood and water, at which point the evangelist says, I'm telling you, this is true. I saw it. I was there, you know, and, and so he's, he's almost protesting. Don't, don't discount this. This is not symbolic. I saw the blood and the water come out. Uh, you know, and, and again, we know that this uh, particular uh, person was nailed to, uh, to the cross. That's not unusual. But we know that the, the person was whipped with a Roman flagrum. Uh, that's not a medieval whip. This is a Roman whip that has three thongs. And on each of those thongs at the end, right, you've got uh, bone chips and steel pellets. And so this thing is curving around the typical Roman, um, you know, scourging, right? So it's, you know, going from the neck all the way down uh, to the ankles. And as it's going around that, those pellets and, and bone chips are just cut, cutting into the man and tearing away his flesh uh, every time he's whipped. And of course, there's 124 um, uh, marks of those strands on, on his back. And, and so we know that he was just whipped severely to the point of probably so much blood loss. Uh, that's what um, uh, disabled him from actually um, being able to carry the cross uh, by himself uh, to Calvert. But um, um, uh, anyway, I, I'll just say that the man, by the way, has a uh, just kind of a very protruding uh, swollen uh, um, um, you know, uh, wound on the top of the shoulder there, uh, you know, that would have been uh, produced by something as heavy as a cross and carrying the cross. So we, we see all this evidence of Jesus's unique crucifixion uh, that's uh, garnered in the, uh, in the accounts of the gospel. So that's yet another indication. Now, and, and by the way, there's some kind of reciprocal evidence here because, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the physical and anatomical uh, considerations are so perfect. I mean, how is a medieval forger going to get this right? How's he going to know what angle, you know, the spear is supposed to go up? How's he going to know what a Roman crown, how's he going to know what a Roman fl a flag or a, a Roman whip is, you know, with the bone chips, et cetera, at the, at the end? I mean, it, it's just, uh, it's, 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 you know, it does validate that uh, what the, the scriptures say is true, but also the scriptures validate in a way the shroud too, in, in, in a sense. It's like, yeah, th this could be the guy. 
this, this, this account is so accurate compared to what we're seeing uh, physiologically and anatomically uh, that, that this really could be the guy. And by the way, as I said, the blood of the man clearly is produced by someone who's experiencing a polytrauma. Could a, a medieval forger have guessed that there were these enzymes that actually marked uh, a polytrauma in, in, in a human? Of course not. I mean, it's absurd to, to, to think otherwise. It's absurd to think that a medieval forger got these coins and put it on the man's eyes or the exact, and uh, with the exact enigmas of the, of the, the special meaning and punch poly in 2980. This, this is, you know, the, it's getting so far fetched not to believe in Jesus. You got to bend over, uh, you know, uh, backwards. But then, then you get the evidence of the resurrection. That's the mind blower of all mind blowers. And, and again, it's almost like a reciprocal kind of evidence in, in a strange way. Because, uh, first of all, we, um, you know, we have to explain this image. How did we get a perfect three-dimensional photographic negative image on a non-photographically sensitive linen cloth? Well, first of all, this image is sitting on the top of the uppermost surface of the cloth, right? So the uppermost fibrils, the, the image never penetrates into the middle of the fibers wow. or into the middle of the cloth. It's sitting there on the uppermost surface. That's it. And so you look at that and you go, wow. Now, could paint have done this? Could dye have done this? Could any liquid or vapor have done this? Absolutely not. If you put any liquid right there, it would have penetrated immediately into the middle of the fibers and the fibers. Mm -hmm. It would have penetrated immediately into the middle of the cloth. And by the way, it would have spangled. It would have gone to the, to the threads next door. So you had some blurriness. You wouldn't get a perfectly precise image. So you get blurriness. Well, how about rubs and dyes? Same thing. How about vapors? Vapor's worse. It would have not only penetrated in the middle of the fibers in the middle of the cloth, it would have spangled even more. It would have been even blurrier than uh, with, with liquids. Okay, that's eliminated. Well, how about scorching? Uh, well, it couldn't be scorching either because if we're scorching, there's a test called fluorescing that you can use, and you can just put that right over, and you can see the absolute signs of any kind of scorching whatsoever in the cloth. The only places where we see the fluorescing occur is in the places that were actually burned on the cloth in the fire of Chambourie. Outside of that, there's no uh, fluorescing on the image of the man himself. So that's, uh, you know, um, uh, luckily easily distinguishable. So, okay, it's not scorching. So what is it? Well, it's light. That's what it's the only physical source of energy we got left. I mean, we can't use chemical energy. We can't use any kind of vapors. We can't use uh, any kind of scorching. Well, we got light. That's what we have left. And well, what kind of light? What kind of light could produce a perfect three-dimensional photographic negative image on a non-photographically sensitive lending cloud? What could do that? Well, I'll tell you. Um, by the way, after a lot of investigation uh, by a guy named John Jackson and Paolo de Lasaro and, uh, uh, and uh, many, many others, uh, here's basically the, the, the end result. It would take, uh, first of all, a, a special kind of radiation that can be in a very short pulse. It's called directional vacuum ultraviolet radiation. Now, why do you need a really short pulse? Well, because in order to produce this image on a non-photographically sensitive clock, you're going to need, get this, six to eight billion, with a B, billion watts of light energy. Now, think about that for just a minute. Six to eight billion <laughs> watts of light energy First of all, it's very unusual for uh, corpses to be emitting uh, six to eight billion watts of light energy from every three-dimensional point uh, on the corpse. Uh, but that's not it. That, that's, by the way, that's a half a million searchlights worth of light energy. So a half a million searchlights. Do you know how powerful one searchlight is? Imagine a half a million, half a million searchlights worth of light energy is bursting out of uh, this dead corpse. And just imagine how much heat a half a million searchlights worth of light energy could produce. Just think about that for a second. And that's a lot of heat. In fact, if that pulsation had lasted any longer than 1 40 billionth of a second, I assure you, there would be not only nothing left of the shroud, there wouldn't even be anything molecularly left of the shroud. It would be reduced to carbon atoms. I mean, that's basically what we're talking about. So what do we have to do? We have to get a 140 billionth of a second manifestation 
of six to eight billion watts of light energy coming from every three dimensional point in that corpse, in that dead body. Now you look at that and you go, oh, does that sound familiar? Does that sound like anything we've heard of from Christian revelation? Uh, the, the, of course, the revelation in glory, the pneumatica soma, and we'll talk about that in, in just a minute, that he rose in glory and power, right? And, and when, when he appears in Matthew's gospel, everybody bows down and worships because they think they're seeing God. Well, why do they think that they're seeing God? Why does Paul, when he sees the risen Christ, he's so overwhelmed by the light that he's blinded? Uh, literally, by the light. Um, and, and so we, we see that uh, uh, there, this manifestation of the, the power of, of, of the, uh, of the uh, manifestation and the light, uh, you know, that's manifested and the glory, it's there writ large in scripture. So um, uh, that's the first indication. But as they say in the, in the, uh, in the ads, there's more. <laughs> and what's even more interesting is that if you look at that, you know, what an MRI does, right? MRI does what's called layered three-dimensional imaging, right? So you can see through various layers, just you can see the, the depth of what's going on. So you can actually see inside like the man's hands. You can see the bones, the actual bones in his hands, and you can see that relative to the flesh that's covering it in perfect proportional three-dimensional layering, like an MRI got done. Now you look at that and you go, well, wait a minute, how can this happen? Obviously, you didn't have an MRI there, so uh, a magnetic uh, resonance imaging device. So what happened? So, well, um, the cloth is going to have to penetrate at least three sixteenths of an inch into the man in order to get the bones relative to the flesh on the bones in per perfect proportionality uh, to the reality of, of, of human uh, anatomy and physiology. So uh, you mean the, the, the body had to turn mechanically transparent? That's it. The only way you can actually get a three sixteenths of an inch penetration, at least it could have gone, the body could have gone all the way through, the cloth could have gone all the way through the entire body, but at least three sixteenths has got to be there because you would not get that imaging of the bones relative to the uh, flesh without that penetration. That means the body had to turn spiritual. So if you think about that for a second, that's a second indication of Christian revelation. I mean, we, the Jewish view of revelation has no pneumaticon soma, has no spiritual body uh, in it whatsoever. Uh, uh, it's a physical view of resurrection. So at the end of time, uh, we're all going to rise, but we're basically going to be like resuscitated uh, corpses that get to live forever. Ever, uh, be, you know, kind of new, improved, physical, resuscitated corpses, but that uh, live forever. That's not the Christian view. The Christian view is we will become spiritual like Jesus. Uh, what was Jesus? Jesus was spiritually uh, raised. He was a pneumatic on Soma. They thought they were seeing a spirit. He was raised in glory. They're bowing down in worship. But John, for the first time in his gospel, starts calling, uh, you know, Jesus as he appears on the show, uh, on, the, on the shore, right? Hakurias, Hakurias, the Lord, the Lord, which is, uh, you know, the uh, Greek translation of, of the Hebrew Hadden Adonai or Yahweh, right? The, 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 the name for God. And so you, you, all of a sudden you begin to see they're all talking about Jesus looking like a spirit, Jesus, uh, you know, transformed in light, Jesus looking like God, uh, you know, et cetera. They're, they're talking about a transformed Jesus and he's transformed in exactly the way the Shroud of Turin is showing it. It's almost as if God had a sense of humor and 2000 years ago put all of this evidence that we could have only known about with devices like MRIs and ARF eczema lasers. And by the way, that little, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, six to eight billion watts uh, of light energy uh, with a one forty billionth of a second uh, pulsation, uh, Paulo de Lasaro and his team actually showed this on the basis of ARF eczema lasers uh, back in 2007 and showed that when you pulsed, uh, you know, that brightness of light um, uh, on a uh, cloth with similar spectral reflectance to the Shroud of Turin, you'll get the exact kind of image we see. So uh, the point I'm getting to is, hey, 
All I can say is the scientific evidence is pointing directly to the glorious, luminescent, and, and, and a powerful spiritual resurrection of Jesus Christ that's in the Christian testimony in the Gospels. Just saying, I think this is another evidence of the authenticity of the shroud, but the shroud at the same time is pointing uh, to the truth of the spiritual and glorious resurrection of Jesus as uh, was accounted for in the scriptures. So that's, uh, uh, that's, that's an impressive piece of extra biblical testimony. And, you know, of course, you can't be 100% right in any scientific thing. So I'll just say I'm 99% sure that this is a really good testimony, the Shroud of Turin, and I've written about it extensively. But if you just go to uh, CredibleCatholic.com and uh, click on module um, number four, uh, go to CredibleCatholic.com, click on Access to Free Resources, click on module four, and find out all about it. You want to find out about the evidence for the um, uh, transphysical soul from near-death experiences and terminal lucidity? Uh, just click on CredibleCatholic.com, go to Access Free Resources, and go to Module 1. You want to find out about uh, um, uh, the miraculous evidence that validates the church? Go to CredibleCatholic.com, click on Access Free Resources, and go to Module 5. And by the way, if you really want a super course on this, if you want to just, you know, get the full detail on everything from multiverses to the Shroud of Turin and all of its, uh, not just scientific glory, but, you know, it's philosophical, historical, scriptural, theological glory. Uh, just take a look at our master teacher program in contemporary apologetics. I uh, just go to CredibleCatholic.com and click on master teacher program. That is not free of charge. Uh, however, um, uh, there is somebody uh, there in Australia uh, who's trying to bring uh, the master teacher program there uh, in several dioceses uh, in Tasmania, I think. Uh, uh, and um, uh, shortly, uh, there should be an announcement of what uh, he is doing. Yes, fantastic. Well, ma amazing, the evidence there. Thank you so much for that. I just can't help think the Shroud of Turin, of course. Um, yeah. We have an artifact right here, right now, proving not only this man existed, it ties perfectly in, almost perfectly, as you say, uh, with the crucifixion and resurrection. And myself, when I saw an image, I, I had a vision inside of a Catholic church on the door of a tabernacle, the image of the Shroud of Turin, the very image that proves the resurrection, the, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. When on the front cover of my, my testimony, how Islam led me back to Christ, and it was through oh, wow. Islam uh, that deny the, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection, of course, and it, look what image God sort of shown me <laughs> um, oh, inside of a Catholic church, the shroud. We couldn't have picked a better image than that one. And later to discover the importance of that image is just phenomenal. So thank you for the work you're doing there, Father. Oh, now, we probably uh, only have time for w one more, if we could, uh, if that's possible. Okay. Squeeze one last question in. All the right. Catholic church. Now, we yeah. know Christianity, Jesus Christ, his Lord, uh, and, and 2 billion Christians around the world believe in that. What mm -hmm. about the Catholic Church? What, how do we go so far even further again to say that the Catholic Church is, I guess, uh, the one true church? What Can you, can you explain? Uh, sure. Um, I would say, again, if you, just go to, if you really want to know the full um, answer, uh, just go to CredibleCatholic.com and click on the Master Teacher Program and click on uh, Module Number 5. But okay. for the time being, let me give you the really short answer. First of all, there has been a lot of excellent contemporary exegesis on that Logion of Matthew 16, uh, 17 through 19. Now, this is a really important Logion. And people sometimes, a lot of people, ah, oh, it's just Matthew. He wrote that. Uh, he's the only one who has it. Nay, nay, nay. Matthew's not the only one who has it. Uh, in Paul's letter to the Galatians chapters 1 and 2, you can see remnants of that very narrative known by Paul much earlier than would have uh, been known uh, in the, um, uh, that would have been present in, in Matthew's gospel, which was written later than Paul's letters. But we definitely see that Paul is aware of some kind of a, of a narrative or logion similar to the Matthew 16, 17 through 19 
um, you know, that's the one where Jesus says, you, you are Peter, and upon this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall never prevail against it. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you declare bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you declare loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, that's um, uh, that uh, Logion is really important, as I'll explain in just a moment. But the second thing we know is that that Logion, it was never written in Greek. Right. It was written in Aramaic for sure. And it's an Aramaic tradition. Uh, that's for sure. And in uh, again, I explain why this goes back to, to, to Jesus himself. It's not that it comes from an early Aramaic tradition prior to a Greek text. It is the fact that there are all these uh, typical things um, that are unique to Jesus. For example, these Abba references, um, you know, that are in that passage. Um, is uh, very unique to Jesus. The second is uh, Jesus changes the name of Peter. You don't go around changing anybody's name and undermine the prerogative of the parents. You'd have to be someone in Peter's life who has much more prerogative than the parents to name you. And that, of course, would be somebody of like a divine uh, you know, origin of, of huge religious significance. And so that's written right into the passage. Uh, you know, they calls him, you know, uh, um, you know, Peter, uh, Cephas, instead of Simon. Uh, this, this renaming is a, a very, very big thing, uh, pertaining, of course, to the, to the, to the uh, founding of the church itself. And that, that's another thing. By the way, um, you know, it's not just the Abba references, but there's what's called the emphatic ego. And I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, blah, 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 blah. So that I say where well, you have, you know, ego, a me, right? Or you or ego, lego, uh, I should say, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you, you don't need the ego. When you have the emphatic ego, that's a definite characteristic of Jesus proclaiming something akin to doctrinal authority. So it's all kinds of indications of the obsissima vox, of, of the, um, you know, the, the very voice of Jesus. Uh, in, in, in these Gospels. So that's the first thing that's, that's really uh, kind of fascinating. But uh, it, it goes much deeper um, th than that. When you begin to analyze the, the passage, um, uh, when you look at it, the first thing you notice is that um, uh, Jesus tells uh, uh, Peter, you're the rock, you're the foundation. And upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And then he promises that the gates of the netherworld will never prevail against it. Then he goes to something interesting. He says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What are these keys? And the main thing uh, that is really important here um, is that the keys symbolize uh, uh, what's called the prime minister's office. Um, so when, for example, if you go to Isaiah, I think it's 2121, um, and, you know, Isaiah comes and delivers the oracle against Shebna, uh, as you might recall. And he says, you know, I'm taking the keys away from you, Shebna. What keys? The keys to the prime minister's office, the keys to the kingdom. Uh, that's the office. I'm taking these keys away from you and I'm going to give them to Eliakim. And then he goes on to say that when Eliakim has them, he shall declare, right? He shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. Does that parallel anything you have heard before? Of course, it parallels. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, whatever you declare, <laughs> bound on earth, bound in heaven, loose in, loose in heaven. It's uh, obviously Jesus hearkening back to the Shebna, to the Isaiah or Oracle against Shebna. But not only that, what's more important is he's talking about an office. He's not just giving some keys to Peter. Jesus has created an office, and he's giving that office through the keys to Peter as the first recipient. Oftentimes people just try, especially some of our Protestant brethren, try to over, like they gloss right over this fact that it's not just Peter who is getting a charge. Jesus is has created an office of the prime ministership to stand in his place. He's the king, 
to stand in his place as prime minister uh, of, uh, you know, the kingdom of heaven and listen to the power whatsoever he declared loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You've got to be kidding me. Whatsoever he bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. So, of course, he's giving a kind of a, 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 a an absolute authority uh, along with this, but the keys themselves are the key to the passage because that tells you uh, that this is a highest office of juridical authority, a highest office of teaching authority. And it's being not only conveyed upon Peter, but it is likely to last beyond Peter. So in other words, why create the office if Peter will be the sole holder of it? He's creating the office because he's anticipating that there will be holders of the office after the time of Peter. So I think this passage is really, really important. I think it does give very good um, uh, authority from scripture about a, a, an office of supreme juridical and teaching authority. But then I go on to take a look at 20th century and 21st century, uh, uh, in other words, contemporary scientifically validated miracles pertaining to the church and, um, um, uh, you know, in this case to Mary, uh, to the Holy Eucharist and to the saints. Now, right now, I'm, uh, you know, I don't have time to go into all these miracles, but because the Eucharist has been kind of thrown into question in this day and age, uh, let me just kind of put it, you know, uh, you know, as the uh, uh, in terms of the uh, the Eucharist itself, um, sure. uh, you know, uh, maybe one of the Eucharistic miracles. There's two of them that are really fascinating. I'm going to leave out uh, the Tixla, Mexico uh, 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 Eucharistic miracle, but the one in Buenos Aires in 1996 is quite fascinating. And the one in Sokolka, Poland in 2008 is very fascinating. Uh, by the way, this is a jaw dropper uh, because what you see, uh, and I'm not going to go to the history of the miracles right now, just to say that you have the substance of the host and growing out of the host in the Sokolka miracle, growing out of the host is a piece of flesh. Now, what's so interesting about this piece of flesh? By the way, there's only about, uh, you know, one uh, diameter of a human cell, right, between the substance of the host and the substance of this heart tissue, this flesh, right, that's growing out of the host. So it's finely, finely, finely integrated with the substance of the host. And by the way, we can't even do this with NASA technology. We cannot produce a trans um, a mutation uh, of this uh, kind, um, uh, even with the NASA technology. It's too refined, it's too integrated between the two different kinds of substance. But the story doesn't end there. When you actually, uh, by the way, that's been documented by electron microscope uh, in, in Poland uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, now you take a look at the uh, cardiac tissue that's growing out of that, the substance of the host. That cardiac tissue uh, is uh, from the upper left ventricle of the heart, does kind of all the pumping of the blood through the heart. And what you notice in, in that uh, tissue is a proliferation of white blood cells. Uh, white blood cells can only exist in a human body uh, when the human body is, is alive. So in other words, the moment a body dies, the white blood cells disappear very, very quickly. And so this piece of tissue has the white blood cells embedded in the ventricle wall. Now that means that in order to get that, uh, uh, this proliferation of white blood cells, um, and let's suppose the Catholic Church wanted to perpetrate a fraud. Uh, then um, what you would do is you, you go ahead and you, um, first of all, you, well, first of all, oh, let me say one last thing about the white blood cells. They're embedded in the ventricle wall. The only way that uh, white blood cells embed themselves in the ventricle wall is when somebody is experiencing, again, a polytrauma. Somebody's being beaten severely around the chest. Now, all that being the case, what would it take for the Catholic Church to perpetrate a fraud of this quality of, of this uh, Eucharistic miracle? First, you'd have to take the, uh, uh, a human being, you'd have to open them up, and uh, right while they're still, well, first you have to beat them uh, near to the point of death, 
then you'd have to open them up while they're still alive, the heart's still beating, and then kill them by removing the upper part of their left ventricle uh, as you know they're they're howling in torture uh, from you carving their heart up while they're still alive. Uh, now, is the Catholic Church going to do this? No, the Catholic Church will not do this to perpetrate a fraud, but that's what would be required to get the proliferation of white blood cells embedded in the ventricle wall. But the mystery does not start uh, stop there. How then do you get, to, how do you connect that piece of tissue, which you have uh, by ill-gotten means uh, uh, used to, 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 to get, how are you gonna connect that to the substance of the host? Uh, with a basically one, um, uh, the diameter of one human cell uh, between the substance of the host and the substance of the tissue. How are you going to make that connection happen? We don't even have the technology today in any lab to do that. Uh, I leave you with that uh, little mystery, because if that really is, of, well, we might say in a kind of a biological sense, transubstantiated uh, from the host uh, 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 to the uh, actual uh, flesh uh, there. That is a remarkable little miracle that we are incapable of explaining, but points to the mystery of the real presence, the real body and blood of Jesus, just as was recounted in John, uh, in that wonderful Eucharistic discourse in John 6, 38 and following. Amen, amen. Wow. <laughs> and that's just scratching itself. Do you have more material on, on Eucharistic miracles? Oh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. If you just go again um, um, uh, to uh, uh, CredibleCatholic.com, uh, you can, uh, there's a, um, uh, go to module five, and we have, a, there's a kind of a whole appendix on the miracles. Just go down to the end of the appendix on miracles for module five uh, in the master teacher program. Um, you can see it um, and there you'll get a very uh, lengthy analysis of it. However, if you want a very brief analysis of it, um, go to modgiscenter.com. Modgiscenter.com. So it's a different website yep. and just click on free articles and resources. And then um, you just see one called Contemporary Scientifically Validated Miracles. Go to the end of that article and you'll get a very nice uh, summary of the Buenos Aires one. Uh, but I don't think the Sekulka one is in there. Uh, you'd have to go to the um, CredibleCatholic.com to the Master Teacher Program uh, to get the Sekulka one. Okay, we'll make sure that the website is up on the screen for you and in the description below. Make sure you click on that. I want to thank you, Father Spitzer. Wow, what a what a session we had just then. Um, it's jaw-dropping, as you say. I mean, all this evidence, it's overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, it um, and, and we're only scratching the surface. And th th that was the, the idea of this course, an introduction to faith and science. And, and, and the idea is that we get a bit of a taste of it all. And then if people want to go deeper into, into this, this area of science, uh, they can go to marjacenter.com. And, of course, please enroll in those other courses to take further study um, with Father Spitzer there. Thank you for all you're doing, Father, and please know of our prayers, and thank you for being a part of the Perusia Academy. God bless you, Charvel. Thank you. And, everyone, thank you. That's a, a, a great special session here, a Q&A session uh, at the end of this module, Faith and Science. We hope you've enjoyed this course. Don't forget, if you do want to get your assessment, you can actually uh, write a 1,000-word essay answering uh, one of the questions there. And uh, please do so and you'll get a qualification um, in the certificate for mission with Perusia Academy. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your study. Take the most, make the most of this whole opportunity studying all these great courses. God bless you.